Welcome to the Science and Beers podcast with me, Mick McGee. Talking science and drinking beers with researchers down at the pub. So join us with the brew and let's cheers to science. I am so happy to be back again with the Science and Beers podcast. It's been uh, a long time since our last season and uh, the bars are still unfortunately closed. So we're still doing this remotely, but we're really hoping to be back out there with some fresh pints. But we made the best of what we've got, and I've got a a real, real fun season planned with uh, at least 10 episodes of uh, the third season of the podcast. Today I am joined by Professor Paul Sharp. Paul Sharp is from Kent in England, but Paul is an expert on the economic history of Denmark. So we're, we're going to get into, into some of uh, his revelations. Paul heads the Historical Economics and Development Group at the Department of Business and Economics at the University of Southern Denmark. He's also a Senior Fellow of Business and Social Science at the Danish Institute of for advanced studies. And you're going to hear me talking a lot about this institute over the, the coming season because I'm just very much inspired by the idea behind the institute. So the best way to describe the talent at, at DS is if it was a concert, we're talking about Ross Kilda Festival, 1996 with Bjork, Rage Against Machine, David Bowie, Nick Cave, Pulp, Slayer, Underworld, <laughs> Toots and the Maytals, Left Field. <laughs> uh, who else is going to be on that lineup? I'm just looking at the lineup here on the on the screen. DAD, if you're Danish. The Sex Pistols. <laughs> so so that that's the kind of level we're talking about here. But the interesting thing about DS is that they don't just focus on one area of research. They incorporate engineering, social science, humanities, and the natural sciences and health sciences. And they have a building where the, the most influential researchers in all of these fields get together and meet up with the, with the just just a possibility that they'll be able to to bounce ideas off each other and something's going to come out of it. And I'm certain that something will. There is actually a method of assessing. Of course there is. We're talking about science here. There's a method of assessing uh, numerically how influential a researcher is. So it's called the H-index. And it, it's, it's kind of a numerical assessment of how many peer-reviewed papers a person has published in their career and how many times have they been quoted. Uh, so that's a measure of how influential they are. And it's generally assumed that a H factor of 60 is extraordinary. But amongst the chairs at DS, they have uh, their their half of them have a, a factor over over sixty. Uh, a few of them have a factor over one hundred, and three of them are actually in the top one percent of the most influential researchers in the world. And I I was reading this the other day. I just went on a on an internet uh, you know search hole, and I found this out, and I. I find myself getting goosebumps reading into to some of the work that some of the members of DS has done. Goosebumps, I can get goosebumps or, or the chills if I listen to music, music that really hits me in a certain way. And the, uh, the fact that this happened, just reading about the achievements of some of these people, just filled me with, with awe. And the fact that they work just on the road from where I am, 
makes me first and foremost really really motivated to invite them all out for a beer and have a chat <laughs> about what it is that they do so so that's what you're going to be hearing uh, in the next season of this podcast is uh, is me inviting these these very clever people out clever and influential people out for a for a beer it could be a virtual beer or an in-person beer depending on the situation but uh, i hope you will enjoy tuning in and having a listen and uh, and seeing what it's all about cheers Hello, hello, Paul. You good? Hello, hello. We're good to go. Do, do you have a beer there? I do. I have my Kilkenny. Oh, yeah. And I poured it. <laughs> well, it, being, it being St. Patrick's Day, I am on. Oh, dear, the Guinness. Yeah. I hope this doesn't go all over my life. As I said, I, uh, I stupidly believe they would have some Guinness left over, you know, at the, uh, at the supermarket, but... It all been taken for St. Patrick's Day. I Indeed. Guess it, Indeed. I wasn't the only one with that idea. So I, sh- I should have had the Guinness poured, you see, because normally you have to let the Guinness settle. Well, but I'm going no, to give you that's... I'm going to give you a skull yeah. anyway. So skull. Cheers. Cheers. Mm-mm. So Paul, just let's just take it from the top. What is economic history? That's a good question. So um, I have two definitions. There's a boring definition and an interesting definition. So the, <laughs> the boring definition is very technical, which is really that it's just uh, using the tools of economics, so economic theory and statistical uh, methods on history. But I think the more interesting definition is uh, basically what I think about when I think about what economic history is. And it's more maybe more a motivation rather than a definition. And I would say uh, this is really about trying to understand some of the big questions uh, of, uh, of history and of, and of humanity in general, and in particular, why some countries are poor and other countries are rich. And if you think about it, we all started off kind of in the same uh, boat somehow. We were all poor uh, hunter-gatherers and we became poor farmers. And for most of human history, humankind has been very poor. But for some reason, certain countries at some point started to become rich. And uh, this is really the big sort of mystery. Why is it that certain countries became rich and other countries stayed poor? And this creates the, or created the inequality that there is in the world today. And so for me in particular, I'm trying to understand, in a lot of my research at least, I'm trying to understand how Denmark became the rich and successful uh, country it is today. Well, this, this, this is it. We have the, we're both privileged to live in one of the richest countries in the world today. So I'm really curious to, to hear some theories about how, how we got here. I'll have to say that we're not Danish ourselves, we're, we're Irish and English. Uh, yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I mean, other people have other motivations. So, for example, you could say, what can we learn uh, for handling the corona crisis based on the experience from the Spanish flu back in 1918? And, or the, what can we learn for handling, uh, dealing with the, uh, the financial crisis that was in 2007, 2008, based on what happened in the Great Depression in the 1930s? So a lot of the motivation is also what lessons can we take from the past uh, for today? But I think for me, at least, it's, it's this big question of why some countries, for some reason, became so rich, which is really a, a sort of historical, um, historically a very strange and unusual thing to be, because for most of human history, we've been very, very poor. Well, it, yeah, I, I, I agree. Up, up until just a few hundred years ago, everybody was in the same boat, really, before, before the economies were created and therefore imaginary money. And, and landing could could become a thing. Am I talking out of my hole here? Or... <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that. Uh, I think a lot of people think it's to do with, I mean, being well off is not to do with having a lot of money. I mean, if you think about it, you could have, uh, you know, a huge amount of um, of krona, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything if you can't spend it on something. And it depends on, you know, how much you can actually purchase for that. So people have been well off before there was even money. I suppose the the people that uh, created the uh, the pyramids, they were probably quite well off, even mm-hmm. though there probably wasn't a monetized economy at the time. So it's not so much about that. It's more a question of how we became able to produce so much. So produce so much in terms of goods and services. Uh, and therefore, we're able to consume so much. 
So it's really the consumption of things which makes us better off rather than actually having money. I mean, people, of course, can become happy because they look at their bank accounts and see they have 10 million pounds or whatever. Uh, but that's, uh, you know, in the end, that's not really what, what life is about. It's about actually being able to use that money on something. So money is more a measure of uh, what we can consume rather than uh, something which is good in itself. Well, that's a very good point. Um... Paul, I know you wrote a book called uh, The Land of Milk and Butter, How Elites Created the, the Modern Danish Dairy Industry. Um, but before we get into the, the revelations of the book, could you, could you can we paint a picture of what Denmark was like maybe, what, 300 years ago? It's a very different place. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> very good. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> Yeah, that's the end. Then we drink our beers. Uh, no, yeah. uh, it was it. <laughs> it was, uh, of course, it was extremely different. I mean, it's, and it's different in perhaps ways in which other countries are are not so different. And I think the kind of obvious thing is that Denmark was uh, geographically a very different country. If we can talk about countries uh, back in the 1700s, so I mean, Denmark or the monarchy of Denmark was covering Denmark, Norway. Uh, Schleswig and Holstein in, in Germany, what's now Germany mostly, uh, Faroe Islands, Iceland, Greenland, and some small colonies in the Caribbean and uh, India and so on. And of course, Denmark had recently lost the southern part of uh, what's now Sweden to, uh, to Sweden. So geographically, it was a much larger area. But I think a more interesting point is what does it actually mean to have a country or to be a nation or to be Danish at that time? And I think a lot of people, what, what a lot of people don't realize when they think about um, their own country or about another country is that this is really something which is quite quite new. I mean, the idea of belonging to a country, uh, having a, a sort of a role as a citizen in a country is something which at the very earliest emerged at the end of the 1700s. And so, you know, you have to think, well, you know, what, what were people identifying with back then? People were identifying more with basically where they were born. So the, there's a Latin concept called patria, which is translated normally into fatherland. This concept in the past just referred to where you were actually born rather than uh, a country which you belong to. And then it was kind of taken by people who were trying to form nations uh, in order to have a, a way of making feel like an identity. So they would pay taxes to the king and uh, fight wars and this type of thing. And this is something which emerged at that time. So that's one kind of aspect is, or two aspects actually. One. It's geographically a much different area. Uh, secondly, people wouldn't necessarily have thought about themselves as belonging to a country known as Denmark or Denmark, Norway, or whatever we would have called it at the time. But then there's, there's of course, also the way in which they lived at the time, which would, would have been clearly very different. I mean, obviously, it's going back in time. They had different technologies. They didn't have uh, access to, uh, to the internet and things like that. But there's also the kind of whole institutional setup was extremely different from the Denmark we know today. Mm -hmm. So you had, of course, uh, and well, not of course, because not every country had that at the time. But in Denmark, at least, you had an absolute monarchy. So the monarch was officially appointed by God and could do whatever he liked. Uh, you had uh, <laughs> most people uh, would have been living in a state of what is normally described as serfdom. So there was a form of coerced labor where you uh, were not allowed to move away from the area where you were born and you had to work for the landowner and, and this sort of thing. Uh, you had all sorts of local monopolies and this type of thing. And then the kind of general economic condition in the 1700s was not particularly amazing for Denmark. And a lot of this has to do with uh, the fact that Denmark has fought more wars against its neighbor, Sweden, than any other pair of countries has fought against each other. <laughs> and uh, sadly for Denmark, I suppose, uh, a lot of these were lost by Denmark, which led to the country going bankrupt. So the economic condition was also really pretty dire at the time. So, so whenever you say it was dire, are you comparing it to the rest of Europe? Other yeah, countries? so there are some, yeah. So there are a bunch of studies which uh, try to recreate uh, GDP statistics or wages and this type of thing so you can measure living standards in the past and uh, the data that we have available basically shows that Denmark was probably one of the poorest countries in Europe and it wasn't just that it was poor so that's one thing that you can measure somehow the average income of a, of a person at the time uh, but it was also a country which was even in an environmental sense was extremely challenged 
And this also goes back to these wars with Sweden. So as part of the process of fighting the war, of, of, of all these many wars, uh, basically up over this southern part of Sweden. Uh, of course, you have to construct a lot of um, a lot of things, including a lot of a lot of ships, which you use to uh, have naval battles against your neighbour. And these require a large amount of wood, which uh, meant that basically pretty much all the forests in Denmark were cut down by, by at some point in the 1700s. Wow. And this led to all sorts of soil erosion, desert formation, which you don't really think of Denmark in terms of deserts, but deserts were forming in uh, in Jutland at the time. And uh, silting up of waterways, which meant you couldn't get the ships out to trade with other countries and, and all sorts of things like that. So it was really a, a pretty miserable, miserable state to be in. That, that's time. so interesting to hear about the environmental issues back then, because you think of environmental issues as, uh, as modern problems, but absolutely not. It's yep. just we're used to Denmark today not having any, any natural areas anymore, no, no uh, very little tree coverage. And it's also very interesting to hear right. that Denmark was one of the the poorest countries in Europe back then, because it's, it's certainly not today. No, so, well, exactly. What, what, what happened then? How did they turn the tables? <laughs> what happened? Yeah, so this is a lot of what my uh, research is about. So as I said, I'm kind of inspired by this idea of trying to understand what enables countries to become rich. And I think Denmark has, a, has an interesting story to tell. It's not necessarily the most interesting, but it's what I know most about. And um, it's it's kind of a story which I would say goes back to the 1700s, more or less. Uh, it's it's partly a reaction to what happens in terms of the, the the terrible state that Denmark was in at the time, having lost all these wars, um, having these environmental issues and so on, and the various institutional changes which were put in place to try to make things better and to try to be able to defend itself. I mean. At some point, Denmark even worried about being able to exist as, a, as an independent country. I mean, not, not at that stage, but by the time you get to the 1800s and wars are being fought against Germany, then that was that was certainly the case. And so there's a lot of things which are put in place to try to, to, try to change things. And uh, somewhat ironically, what my research has, has shown and, and what my book is, is discussing is that this really seems to start with uh, the sad story of Denmark losing a lot of these wars. So as part of the process of losing these wars, a couple of things happen. The monarch goes, or the king goes more or less bankrupt, and then you have these environmental issues. Because of the environmental issues, you want to try to do something to make agriculture um, kind of sustainable again. So, so you have to put in place new ways of using the land which are, which are more sustainable, and including planting more forests and this type of thing. But the more interesting question for me, at least what I've looked at mostly in my work, is, is the changes which come about uh, because, which is almost purely by chance, I think. So because the king goes bankrupt, uh, he needs to raise some money. And a lot of what he owns is land which is the case for many monarchs at the time, of course. And so a pretty easy way of earning some money was to start selling off this large amount of land that he had. And of course, people at the time, they kind of looked at this and said, well, maybe uh, you know we could do something better with this land. Maybe the king was probably not the best farmer. There's probably <laughs> better ways we could use mm -hmm. this land. Uh, but they didn't really reach any very useful conclusions, actually, with a, a bunch of different commissions they set up to look at this issue and so on. And what actually happened was that people from outside of what we know of today, at least as Denmark, uh, bought up this land and moved into, moved into the country. And I think it's kind of a nice story as well of how uh, basically foreigners, people speaking another language, can move into your country and bring new knowledge and actually help uh, the, the economic situation in that country. And I can be a bit more specific, maybe about what exactly these or who these people were and, and so, what so they did it, and this sort of thing. The king selling his land, the king wants to sell it for the highest price possible. It's, it's not going to be your average uh, peasant farmer that's going to be able to do that. It's, it's uh, somebody with some money. So who were these people that bought the land? Exactly. So most of these people that bought the land were uh, elites, uh, what we call in the book elites, uh, basically large landowners uh, based in what were formerly parts of the Danish monarchy, but not part of the Kingdom of Denmark, i.e. the duchies of Schleswig and Holstein, which are now mostly uh, in northern Germany with a small part, which is back in Denmark after the First World War. Uh, so these are big landowners who were there who actually already had a more sophisticated agricultural system than Denmark had at the time. And what was kind of special about the system they had was 
uh, it's it's a bit, maybe a bit technical to go into, but basically it's a more sophisticated way of dividing up the land. So a lot of the way that you organize agriculture is to do with making sure you don't over exploit it. If you grow the same crop on the land again and again and again, unless you somehow can replace the nutrients, the crops are not going to grow so well. And the way that you solve that problem is by having something called crop rotation, where you plant one thing on one part of land one year and then something else the following year and then maybe another year you leave it as fallow so it's just regaining uh, some the nut nutrients that it needs and uh, so they had a more sophisticated way of organizing this but the really interesting thing in terms of our story is that as part of this new crop rotation system a large part of the land was left left over as pasture and what they used this pasture for was for grazing cattle and this led to this system being very associated with, with uh, dairying. And dairying, not coincidentally, becomes a large part of the Danish development story. And this is kind of connecting these dots is basically what the book is about. So it's saying these landowners move in, they introduce a new type of sophisticated agriculture with a lot of dairying, but then 100 years later, or more than 100 years later, you get the emergence of modern butter factories, which are traditionally seen to be one of the leading uh, kind of indicators of Denmark becoming a modern economy at the end of the 1800s. I think this is a, such a beautiful story. If, if you allow me a what if. So if Denmark had a stronger army and were able to defeat the Swedes, the king wouldn't go bankrupt and the king wouldn't have to sell his land. And then the, the innovation from Germany wouldn't come and you wouldn't have the, the nice structure that gave the Denmark its agriculture and then maybe on further further on down the road Denmark would not be in a good position these are a few what ifs now I've had, a, I've had, I've had half a Guinness so I'm allowed to speculate but but it, it could be a good thing that Denmark kept losing to Sweden <laughs> Exactly. I mean, that's the thing. That's what's so fascinating about history. A lot of it is just coincidence. So, I mean, it could have been the case. There were various things which which happened, which meant that Denmark ended losing uh, the southern part of Sweden. Um, but it could have ended up in a different way. And then, but the thing is, I think, you know, then Denmark would probably have developed in a way, but maybe in a, an extremely different way to what we know today. Or maybe Denmark would have become great, you know, best besties with uh, Sweden and uh, kept Norway and ended up integrating with Sweden and forming a united Scandinavia, which was a lot of what was happening in the 1800s in other countries. So you see the German states unifying, the Italian states unifying. Maybe uh, Denmark and Sweden would have unified and you'd have had a united kingdom of, of Scandinavia or something, and that, which might have developed in a very different way, of course. But we, we just can't know. We have we have what history has, has yeah, given us. And that's, only that's, only that's, speculate. That's, uh, so, so you, exactly, yeah. you mentioned about the innovation coming from Germany, and well, I'm I'm just going to spell it out that that's that's an embrace embracing of, of science, which is uh, which led to progress. Um, but I, I know that it wasn't it wasn't uh, there, there's another theory for for how the the industry progressed in Denmark, and that's the, about how the, the the small and medium sized farmers came together and formed collectives. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, so the sort of somehow what's become almost the sort of traditional narrative in terms of Danish economic history is, and history in general is very much based on this idea of a sort of democratic, independent thinking um, countryside with particularly characterized by cooperatives, as you say. So small landowners or relatively small landowners getting together, pooling their resources and forming cooperatives, especially cooperative uh, butter factories at some point. So this is, this is kind of the, one of the main kind of things that we were up against. And what happened was I, I started looking at this, this story with, uh, with my co-author, Marcus Lamper, who I, I should for sure mention, who is uh, now a professor in Vienna. And what we noticed was that these cooperatives, uh, which are considered to be so important for Danish development, they spread around Denmark within a decade, basically. So the first one was founded in 1882, and by 1890, the whole country is covered with over a thousand of these butter factories, which were pretty sophisticated things with uh, steam power generators and this sort of thing. And we thought, well, that cannot be the case. So that was the only thing that you know, that made a difference. That suddenly the peasants got a great idea and they started making cooperatives. There must have been something happening before that. And this is what made us look further back into time, and we saw that the narrative about Danish 
uh, history before that had not been about these small peasant landowners. It had been about, of course, these great elites who had set up these great manors, manorial farms. They had introduced great uh, agricultural reforms, and it was these guys who were really important for Danish development. And then it was later on that you kind of replace that with this idea of, of these small um, peasant landowners forming cooperatives. And what we kind of do is link these two together and say, well, they're not independent at all. Actually, these elites come in, they bring new technologies, but they also bring a new way of thinking, a sort of enlightened way of thinking where you, you try to use science and experimentation and education to improve things. And this eventually leads to the, um, the peasants being able to take advantage of what the, the elites have discovered in the preceding 100 years. So, so, so the, the, whole, the whole idea yeah. to form collectives, that, that is also an import. Yep, skull. The idea, cool. <laughs> skull, yeah. <laughs> um, it's, an, well, it is an import in the sense that uh, cooperation is generally considered to have been, uh, as a sort of agricultural or organizational system, is generally considered to have come from the, uh, from the UK. Um, so that idea is, 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 is an import. But actually what we argue is that it's not really the organizational structure which is the most important part of this. So there's been also focus on the cooperatives, um, partly because of the, the idea that they were democratic organizations. It was based on small landowners getting together. It was very much based, to, based on the political history of, of Denmark in the beginning of the 20th century. But we say that's not really what was what was actually going on. It was, it was, it was more that they were introducing a centralized production facility. And if you think about what probably everyone learns in, in, in school in history about the Industrial Revolution and how important the factory system was and bringing workers together in one place to produce textiles to export from Manchester and all this sort of thing. Well, actually, these elite landowners were setting up centralized butter factories, very basic factories, but some sort of centralized production facility already in the uh, second half of the 1700s. And it's this idea of centralizing production in this way, which the peasants eventually are able to take on board uh, once you get into the last part of the 1800s. And just to explain why it takes a whole century before they get there, because you might say, well, why was it the elites were so selfish and they just keep this technology to themselves somehow? Well, it's because basically the peasants weren't able to exploit the system because being able to centrally process dairy products and especially to produce butter, is uh, extremely difficult before you have the arrival of a certain technology which is invented in the 1870s. And this technology is called the automatic cream separator. It's a steam powered centrifuge. Basically, you just pour the milk in, it spins around, and the cream is extracted. Best thing since this sliced great bread. Exactly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and it's it basically it, it allows you to produce butter much more eff efficiently than you could do before, where you just had to wait for the cream to rise to the surface and skim it off and then make your butter. But it also meant that you could centralize peasant production. The issue with peasant production was that when you had to deliver your milk into the into any centralized facility, it would become what's called homogenized. So when it's going along the bunch the bumpy country road, the, all the cream would mix into the milk and it would take a really long time before the milk the cream would separate from the milk by the traditional method with a separator that didn't matter. So the elites could centralize production early because they had all of their cattle all around them on the estates. So they were close by to this, uh, this production facility, but the peasants didn't have that luxury. They would have to deliver it to the village, for example, but by the time it got there, it wouldn't be possible to extract the cream so easily. And it was only in the 1870s that you get this new technology, which allows peasants to also centralize their production. So actually our argument is more about education, uh, learning about the benefits of centralizing production, and then, of course, technology in the sense that you get this automatic cream separator coming in the in the 1870s. Ed education again was was leading to to an increase in in the economy, but there's a couple of different stories there, and uh, there's there's you can select how you tell history for your own. Uh, gain in the present moment so you could if you're of a certain political persuasion tell the story about how the the wealthy uh drove the economy or if you were from a different modern political uh line of thinking you could tell the story about how the, the peasants got together and formed these collectives uh is this is this happening are, are people choosing to tell which which story uh led to the well, economy one we thing, it's yeah it's a terrible cliche but uh you know people always say it's the winners that uh, tell, the, tell the history. They decide what history is. 
And in the end, this is the result of, a, of a, the, the way that history is, is told and taught in schools and this type of thing is based on who has won the last political battle. <laughs> And uh, if you look at Danish politics, you have two parties. You have the Conservatives, which used to be called Hoya, so the right party, and you have Venstre, which is the left party. These parties represented different groups in society traditionally that Hoya would represent, or that the uh, Conservatives would represent these large uh, landowning elites. And the Venstre party would represent these uh, small, smaller peasant farmers, basically. And uh, of course, while uh, the Conservatives the, the higher party were in charge, then they got to set the narrative and say, well, it's all about us. Uh, but then there was a big fight around about 1900, which eventually leads to uh, basically a democratization of Denmark and, uh, and the Venstre becoming the most powerful party. And uh, then they start telling this alternative story about how it was about these small peasant producers that were the most important. And so that just kind of shows you that how history is really told by whichever group is in charge and whoever's won the last battle, basically. But it, it, it's so interesting how, how, how important it was, the events that happened two, 300 years ago, how it shaped the modern world. But it's also the stories that we tell ourselves can shape our, our sense of identity. You mentioned earlier on about uh, the sense of identity in the 18th century in Denmark was based on where you were born and therefore the people that you know. And I guess there was some kind of marketing branding that the, the 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 kings and queens had to do to create a sense of what it was to be Danish, so people could think of themselves not from Fun or not from Sweden, but from the country of Denmark. Are you able to comment on on how events that you just described have a, can affect the modern sense of being Danish or Danish identity? Yeah, I mean that's that's a good question. It's it's certainly the case that what happened before has had an impact today. That, that's for sure. The kind of the issue with, with thinking about it is how much of the way that we identify ourselves as, so I'm from, uh, from, from Kent, <laughs> where, the, where the variant comes from <laughs> in the UK, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and, uh, but other people, they could be from Norway or Sweden or whatever, but you know, how much of the way they think about themselves as a person from that particular place, how much is that to do with what is actually real? And how much is to do with what history books have been telling us for the last few decades or centuries or whatever it whatever it might be. And I think, you know, I can for sure see that certain things about Denmark today, these of course have historical roots. But as I sort of started by saying at the beginning as well, it's also important to understand at the same time that a lot of the identity that you have as, as a Dane, for example, is based on a process of nation building, which is relatively recent. Um, I mean, a lot of the things which we consider to be traditional are actually a creation of the of the 19th century. So not, not so long ago at all, really. So like a sort of, and a part of the process of nation building is, you know, in, a, in Danish context, it would be, a sort of idea, okay, we have roots going all the way back to uh, to the Vikings. Uh, this is why the Yelling Stone is uh, very important because this shows when Denmark was first created as a country and this sort of thing. It's, it's, it's all somehow, uh, you know, how can I put this diplomatically? But I've had quite a lot of beer, so not so diplomatically. I mean, in my, in my view, it, it, it's nonsense. I mean, it's based on a creation of a feeling of identity, which has certain advantages, but for sure also has uh, some some disadvantages. And I think but perhaps particularly when you look at the case of Denmark, as I started by saying at the beginning, I mean, <laughs> now we think about Denmark as being a particular geographic unit, but in the 1700s, it was at least the monarchy of Denmark was a much larger geographic unit. I mean, Denmark is kind of an example of an incredible shrinking uh, country somehow. It's got smaller over the years, uh, with the small exception of just after the First World War when the southern part of Jutland came back again. Um, and then basically a lot of countries at some point in the late 1700s start to try to create national identities. In the Danish case, this was a lot to do with um, identifying yourself as not being German. And the reason for that is a lot of these elites, which I just kind of almost sang the praises of before, I, I don't necessarily want to do that, but they did some good things. Uh, a, lot, a lot of these people were German speakers. A lot of the elites in, in Denmark were German. If you go to an old church in Denmark, it's quite likely the things written on the wall are going to be in German, and there's a good reason for that. A lot of these powerful uh, families were, were German. And ironically, actually, this kind of creation of a, a feeling of being Danish as opposed to German 
uh, can be uh, linked to a process of nation building which was going on in Germany at more or less the same time where Germany was trying to create its own sense of national identity where they wanted us to show that they were on a par with France basically that German culture was at least as as good as as uh, as French culture and language and this type of thing so you kind of have a, a sort of spread of this idea about about nationalism Mm -hmm. So that's that's one thing is like this sort of idea you have as a, as, a, as a person from a particular country with a particular history and with a sense of identification with a lot of other people who you honestly don't know. It's a bit like, you know, somebody wins a tennis uh, match and we say, oh, we're so proud that this person from my country won that uh, tennis tournament. But in reality, we don't know this person. It could just as well have been someone from some other country. <laughs> yeah. So it's like a, a feeling which is instilled in our heads of being from a particular place and having a, a sense of belonging to that. What I think is kind of more interesting to think about is the kind of cultural side. So I live in Fredericksburg. Uh, it's the place where a lot of the great agricultural scientists in Danish history were based, because it's where the Royal Agricultural College uh, is based, and which is now part of uh, the University of Copenhagen. Uh, when I walk around the uh, the streets here, I see them that they're named after some of these elites, which I mentioned. Uh, also some of these great agricultural scientists. And because this was so associated with the emergence of this sort of scientific rational agriculture at that time. So just looking at the street names, I can see that this is uh, this is something which has affected uh, this sort of thing. But there's so many other examples. I, I gave, gave you the example from politics. So the Danish political system, we have the conservatives and Venstre. These were the Conservatives were the landowning party, the Venster party was the kind of peasant party, and then later on you get the Radical Venster, which is the party representing basically landless, uh, landless people in the countryside. Then of course you get the Social Democrats who are representing the cities. This is based on a, on a sort of process of um, economic change which is happening over time where different groups are emerging which need to be represented by uh, different political parties. But then there's also other things about the economy. So if you look at Denmark's big exports, uh, shipping, Maersk, of course, we all know this is a, a very big shipping company. Why does Denmark have such an important role to play for shipping? Well, this is very much to do with getting its agricultural produce to market. So already in the 1800s, Denmark was building up a big uh, shipping fleet in order to be able to trade, especially with the United Kingdom. Or if you look at medicine, which is another big Danish e export, uh, a lot of this is to do with insulin. Insulin was the original way that you produce this was by extracting it from animals. Denmark had produced this massive animal export industry. There were a lot of these animals kicking around, so you could extract the insulin from them. This gave rise to the, uh, to the uh, Danish uh, medical industry. Or you can even look at uh, kind of more cultural aspects like the sort of food that people eat. So various things like, you know, why do people eat Leopostai? Well, that's because they want to export the bacon uh, to uh, to the UK and you have a few bits of pig left over and then you create some things which you can eat. So you have the Fleskostai and you have the Leopostai. And... For, for our in international list listeners, Leopostai is uh, translated as liver paste. <laughs> yeah, or pate, but it's basically pate, a type of pate, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. And so you're using up bits of the pig, which the English didn't want to eat, basically, or... Uh, there's various types of dairy products which are, have origins in trying to use up some of the waste milk from uh, once you've extracted the cream to make butter and, and this sort of thing. So one of the really nice things about living in a country which isn't your own, so you're kind of looking at somehow from an outsider's perspective, but, but at the same time being really a, a sort of expert on this country, is you notice all sorts of connections between things, which I think most people wouldn't notice. And it, it feeds through all sorts of aspects of Danish society, which I which I find very interesting myself. Well, I find it's also, it's also interesting to look at your own country whenever you've lived outside it for a while. And you notice it's, it's strange quirks. And you also get yes, to see the quirks exactly, of the yeah. new country. A lot of strange traditions here. But uh, yep. how does uh, a guy from Kent then get to become an expert in the economic history of Denmark? Paul? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good question. Well, I, I said that a lot of things to do with history are, um, are rather random. And yeah. I would say that is for sure the case with, with my life when I look back on it. So, um, I mean, I, I went, to, went to school in Kent, as I said, I ended up studying history. I don't know why I ended up studying history. I kind of, I had a really good history teacher at school, so which meant goes, I decided yeah. to do a, do a bachelor in, in history. Um, I then um, decided for various reasons we won't go into, I ended up moving to Denmark, uh, 
and um, I uh, sort of went, I remember I went to the employment office and said, what can I do here? And they said, yeah, okay, you don't speak Danish and you have, you have a degree in history. I'm sorry, that's not, <laughs> that's not going to get you very far. So, <laughs> so I, I, uh, I studied very hard and learned Danish. And then, of course, I realized that in Denmark, they very nicely pay you to go to university. And I thought, well, that sounds, that sounds better than getting a real job. Mm -hmm. So I'll go to, <laughs> go to university. And completely by chance, uh, the only degree which started in the winter rather than the summer or you could choose to start in the winter rather than the summer was economics at the University of Copenhagen. And so I ended up studying economics. <laughs> and of course, because I had this history background, then I started studying economics. And then plus that there were two economic historians at the Department of Economics in Copenhagen at the time. So Carl Gunnar Pearson and Ing Ingrid Henriksen. Uh, this, these things came together, which meant that I thought, okay, it's obvious to try to get, you know, try to work with economic history. And I, I remember even at a very early stage, talking to these two people at Copenhagen about wanting to do a PhD and uh, and working on economic history. So Carl Gunnar Pearson, uh, who sadly passed away a few years ago, uh, he was my PhD supervisor and uh, is a really great was a really great source of inspiration for me. But he wasn't working on Danish economic history. He was proudly Swedish <laughs> and uh, never learned Danish. <laughs> and um, and what he was working on was the history of globalization. And so my PhD was about working on this. But then after the PhD, I wanted to apply for a postdoc. I applied to the Carlsberg Foundation. I thought it might be a good idea to apply for something to do with Danish economic history. I knew pretty much nothing to do about that at the time. But I, uh, so I applied for something to do with dairying because I knew that's what, that's what Denmark did. <laughs> and that's how, that's how the whole thing started. And then I, I really... It's like a lot of things. If you really start studying something and getting to know it, then a bit like, I guess, both of us with beers, you know, once you start getting interested in beers, exactly, then yeah. you, you, you love it even more, one. you know, and it becomes, <laughs> exactly, you love it even more. And it's just, it was the same for me with Danish economic history. It's, it's so, uh, there's so many things to look at and it's relatively unexploited. So there's a lot of kind of low hanging fruits in terms of, uh, in terms of research. And I just got, I got hooked to it basically. And of course, it's an advantage working on history in the country where you're based, because a lot of this is to do with, you know, I have to have access to the archives and this sort of thing, which are which are close at hand. So, well, I love the whole process of connecting the dots in in what can look like a daunting task. But we were talking about <laughs> war and butter and uh, Germans and science and and history and economics, and, and you're managing to, to to bring them all all together. Um, so I, I found found your name because you're part of the Danish Institute for Advanced Study, and I, yeah. I'm I'm a, a huge fan of this uh, this institute because it brings in people from various disciplines, you know. So whenever I, I was studying biology, I just hung out with biologists. What what DS does is brings people together: historians, engineers, biologists, and uh, with the idea of, of uh, you can talk together and uh, your different ways of thinking can spring spring uh, ideas. Up, uh, mm -hmm. has this has have you found out anything from your network within DS? So I mean, DS is uh, it's great. It's a great initiative. Um, it was a really great honor when I was invited into into DS uh, not not so long ago. Um, <laughs> The, the sad thing about DS, I would say, is the fact that we have, of course, the corona right now. So mm. they built this wonderful new building, which is supposed to facilitate this uh, interdisciplinary uh, networking and so on. And we we can't be there. <laughs> so I'm really looking forward, to, of course, like everyone, for all sorts of other reasons as well, including going to the pub, of course. Uh, but I, what, another reason is that it will mean that it's possible to access this building. And then I I know that, uh, you know, there's a bunch of different people who I, I want to uh, want to talk with, with there. But that's not to say that, you know, the, of course, I go to the online lectures and I, I know some people there. And I would say that um, just a bit of a plug, actually. So to get already, this has borne some fruit for me. So I've been networking uh, through DS with somebody from the history department called, called Yepa Nevis. Uh, and we've set up a seminar series with DS on the history of capitalism. And we've put together a, a series of, of speakers uh, from next uh, semester, so after the summer, including people like Thomas Piketty and uh, some other really big names who are going to be coming and, uh, and giving talks. So this this has been great that I've been able to network with uh, with Yepa. And then another really nice thing about DS is that um, 
they've been kind enough to allow um, my little bunch of economic historians, which is called the Historical Economics and Development Group at the Department of Business and Economics at SDU. They've allowed us to hire a couple of, um, of assistant professors. So we have um, Francesco Cinarella, who gave a talk today mm -hmm. at, uh, at one of the DS talks, and uh, Keith Myers, and these were both funded by DS. So this, this is also really great. So I see a lot of, uh, lot of potential going forward. Yep. Well, so this podcast is going to come out on Friday, uh, a few days before you're actually giving a, a, an open DS lecture on Wednesday. So if you're listening to this and it is before March 24th, uh, tune in to, to Paul's DS talk. If you're listening after the 24th of March 2021, then you'll be able to find a recording of Paul's talk on the DS YouTube channel. So if you search for the Danish Institute for Advanced Study, you're going to be able to find a link to Paul Richard Sharp's talk. Uh, you'll be getting in, into more detail of what we talked about. Is that right, Paul? Yes, exactly. More on that and uh, a bit of a bit of background to Danish economic history. It's called the Renaissance of Economic History in Denmark. And uh, I'll be saying a bit about what came before and where I see uh, economic history in Denmark going in the future and this type of thing. So, And a lot, a lot of my own research, of course. <laughs> I'm, 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 it's, it's, uh, it's very dreamy to imagine what uh, Paul, Paul Sharp of 300 years from now is going to be, uh, be, be telling people about the present. You know, what are they going to be trying to, what dots are they going to be trying to connect to explain some, some present phenomena? But uh, I really yeah, loved the, sure. the, the story about uh, you know, everything that, that, that happens, that it, it does have an effect. You know, it's kind of inspiring. You know, what 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 effect do you want things in the present to to happen uh, as, as we move forward? So, yes. Um, Paul, thank you very much. Uh, it is St. Patrick's Day, so no doubt uh, we'll this we will in our own way continue drinking beers into the evening. But <laughs> but uh, that's we'll, we'll stare in through the window of the Irish <laughs> pub and wish we could go inside. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks a lot, Paul. So, Cheers. Yeah. Thanks so much. It was uh, a pleasure and uh, school and happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> Cheers. That was the official end of the podcast. But Paul and I had a little bit more beer left over, so we continued to talk. So the rest is bonus material. And I never asked you about Ireland. Yeah. I never asked you about Ireland because I felt that, you know, we, it would have been too off topic. That's fine. Yeah. We can do that another time. Well, well, I, 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 I'm I'm all ears if you want to tell me how, how Ireland was back then, because because in Denmark, uh, it was its own nation, and yet you had the elites coming in from Germany, and you had the peasants. But in in Ireland, it was not its own nation. It was under English rule, and you had the English elites. Um. Yes. And I think the it was very difficult for any Irish peasants to to do anything against those English elites. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's uh, so that's yeah, basically. So Denmark is often compared with Ireland because um, because Ireland was actually the big butter producer of the 1700s. So Den uh, Ireland had a very long history of being the major center, world center of producing butter. Uh, so there's a Cork Butter Museum. I don't know if you know. I, it's my one of my dreams is to visit it, and I was going to visit it, but then Corona came, so I couldn't go. <laughs> but there, so this was the butter market where they where they kind of auctioned the butter and transported it literally around the world through a sort of I think through a pickling process or something disgusting like that. But they sent it all over the place. So it had this really long history of this. And then uh, when um, basically when Denmark started developing through uh, through dairying in particular, it just completely outcompeted Ireland. And the way that the actually a lot of these elites in Ireland started to respond to this was to say, uh, we have to do the same as, as Denmark does. And, uh, and so they started trying to set up cooperatives and basically almost like force Irish, <laughs> the Irish into cooperatives and said, just do the same as Denmark does and you'll be just as good. And it didn't work so well. And there's like a bunch of theories as to why that's the case. One, one of them is that Irish are just like a grumpy lot and they're always fighting. And so therefore <laughs> they didn't have the necessary level of, of social capital to do this. Whereas Denmark was, ver whereas Denmark was very homogeneous and uh, people got along and so they could form cooperatives and it worked and it worked well. That's, that's a theory which is especially associated with somebody called Kevin O'Rourke, who's a, he's a both Danish and Irish. He has a 
Danish parent and an Irish parent, and he's a, a very he's a leading economic historian, and he wrote about this and said it's all about basically lack of social capital in in Ireland as opposed to Denmark. Uh, but uh, I mean that might be the case, but I, I mean for sure it doesn't help if you're fighting. <laughs> it doesn't help you to form cooperatives. It also didn't help that the Black and Tans went over there and blew up butter factories and stuff like that. <laughs> but I think what the lesson and what what the last chapter of the book with Marcus is is also about this and, and saying that. The lesson from what we look at is that the cooperatives in themselves were not the important thing. It was what came before, especially in terms of having a sophisticated, you know, sufficiently educated workforce, for example. I mean, that's a big difference. I mean, that the the level of agricultural education in Denmark was just on another level compared to Ireland. So setting up a cooperative, but where the members didn't know what they were doing necessarily, that was not the smartest thing to do. And yet I think People have often looked at the Danish example and said, we have to do the same, you know, we just it just has to be cooperation that's going to solve everything. They did it also in India, for example, after the Second World War. So they said, okay, India, it's a poor country with a lot of cows and a lot of poor people. Uh, let's just tell them to form cooperatives and everything mm -hmm. is going to be like Denmark. And it didn't work either. And I think that's because there's this fundamental misunderstanding about what the cooperatives actually meant. The, the cooperatives kind of allowed the peasants to invest in the technology, but it was the education and some other institutions in the yeah. background which well, actually allowed this to work. Well, well that's the thing. You you can tell somebody to or you have to rotate your crops every year and if they understand the reason why then they're going to rotate their crops every year as you mentioned earlier uh but if you just tell them that they have to rotate their crops and they don't understand then they'd say well well i'm going to grow the, the the most profitable thing and then the crops will fail because there's no not enough nutrients in the soil it's the same with wearing masks you can tell people you know you got to wear a mask or and some people would understand the reasons why and other people wouldn't and then they they wouldn't wear a mask right. <laughs> you know, so exactly. education is a, yeah, a, a, exactly. a huge part of the yeah. story. Yeah, exactly. So it's like education and enlightenment in general. So this this sort of way of thinking that you can do things and make things better. And it's, you know, it's worth thinking about things and understanding, you know, what the best way of doing is. This is, even today, is not always necessarily the case. You have ridiculous conversations about things where, like in my opinion, like this AstraZeneca thing is a bit ridiculous, right? So the science is quite clear on this. And yet, there's a bunch of people who are saying, you know, we don't we don't trust it anyway. So there's 14 million people <laughs> that have had the vaccine with uh, no uh, effects that are different from a random effect in the general population. Exactly, 14 and, that, and, that's, million. and that's the thing. And yeah, exactly. And that's, you know, that's also why I think in general, you know, this the fact that Denmark had a very sort of strong attachment attachment to the Enlightenment, and it still has a very strong focus on education and making sure everyone can go to university if they want to, and this sort of thing, is probably what leads to them often making better decisions than certain other countries we yeah. might mention. Right? And I, I and that actually meant that I it was I was a bit shocked actually when it was Denmark was one of the first to come out and say we're not going to use AstraZeneca without any real scientific reason well, for well, doing well, so. It, it, that surprised me. It didn't seem very Danish. Well, it it um. It could be political because, because of the whole Brexit thing, and because the UK blocked exports of AstraZeneca. Maybe because now a lot of the, a lot of the EU countries are saying we don't want AstraZeneca anymore. It could be a, a big fu to, to the UK instead of well, it, it's it's not based in science anyway, so it must be political. There's a lot of people say that, right? And like the latest thing is, I think the EU is saying they're going to block exports to the UK now right, of of the vaccine. So. <laughs> It's terrible. I mean, it's like really sad. And it's, uh, again, sometimes it's nice to learn from history, but sometimes it's kind of depressing because you you see very similar patterns with what's happened at uh, previous points and, you know, previous points in time. And I think the way the world is going in terms of sort of nationalism and isolationism and this sort of thing is not, it, it, it historically hasn't ended up with anything very, very helpful. Let's put it like that. So, um, well, well, and the, I think, you know, just, yeah. History Come repeats on. itself and, and political uh, ideologies tend to repeat itself like uh resurgence of of the far right or, or nationalism just seems to come back but there's there hasn't been any new ideas for a while i watched a fantastic documentary i can't get you out of my head by adam curtis it's like 12 hours mm -hmm. long uh just uh, going around the world over the past 70 years and describing how people have tried to to change the world but it just they they, they can't come up with any anything new you know there's no new ideas so that's why things repeat itself <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a debate about that right now, right? That, that's uh, like, I guess the internet was a big new idea, uh, mobile phone or like smartphones is a big new idea somehow. But then, a lot of things are very incremental compared to what we had before, I suppose. I, I mean, systems of governments uh, and ideologies. Yeah. Okay. In terms of yeah, that's yeah, that could be the case. I, I, I mean, it, but it's always a bit like you kind of 
it's a bit like what I was talking about before. So you somehow you look to the past to say that you have some sort of historical underpinning for what you're doing now. So I don't think necessarily that nationalists or populists today, although they might think they have a connection with something in the past, maybe they, you know, it's like something which they're exploiting for their own good, because what the way people thought 100 years ago about all sorts of things is extremely different to how it is it is today. Right? So, but it's a fascinating story there. The the say the for example, the Venser story saying that the the working class were were the reason that Denmark is where it is today, and people can tell themselves that story, and then they can have a fundamental belief that it's only the working class that, that can that, that can that can get them out out of this economic situation or whatever out of the a recession. Uh, they have a they can have a belief belief in that, but it's at the end of the day, it's a story. It's like a national identity; it only exists inside your head. Yeah, you, exactly. Yeah. Sort of thing. yeah. And I think, you know, but everyone, it, it, it's like, you know, you can't understand everything. So therefore we have to have a simplified way of understanding things. So, I mean, we sort of, it's a bit, a bit like, we know somehow how to use a computer, but we don't really know how the computer works. Right. And it's a bit like that with everything else. So you, you have kind of a, a sort of way of understanding your identity and your history and so on, which is a very, very much simplified version of, of the reality. And, but but I think people need that because otherwise you would go nuts, right? <laughs> you, you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to do anything if you weren't able to sort of make these generalizations about things. And and the, so it's kind of a survival strategy, but at the same time it can can become very unhelpful if it's used in certain connections. Like so, if you decide that all AstraZeneca vaccines are going to give you mm. <laughs> a blood you know a blood clot or something, then that's a very unfortunate link to see, right? So we, we kind of have this as a, a survival strategy, but at the same time, it leads to things which are maybe not very helpful for our, our survival, right? And, so. and, and the, the survival strategy is to hold on to anything that gives us a sense of identity and a sense of meaning. Otherwise, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think, yeah. I think people have a need to feel like they belong to something, which is, which is, of course, fine. I mean, <laughs> so you, you feel the need to to belong to a family or to be, belong to a country or, or whatever. But um, and that's something which is a base, or to belong to a religion or whatever it might be, or to belong to a a supporter of a certain club or whatever. So that's clearly a basic human need, but sometimes it goes a bit too far. Mm -hmm. And then you start not just that I belong to that, but that that makes me better than other people. And then it gets difficult right yeah. and that leads to the unfortunate parts so that could be for the next science and beer talk i think <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a bit more philosophical yeah, yeah. Um. <laughs> great i know it was a really uh, it was a pleasure thanks so much for inviting me and uh great. it was a, an absolute pleasure talking to you and i really hope that we can actually have a pint in a bar someday that would be nice yes yeah <laughs> Okay. Cheers, Bob. Yeah, bye bye. Bye.